be with you this morning. If you have your copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. We'll be looking at verses 49 through 59 this morning. It's a continuation of our journey through Luke's Gospel. We have been in for some time together as a church. Give you a moment to turn there. I so appreciate uh, Adam uh, preaching in my stead last week as we were out of town the week before, and just appreciate him uh, with using the gifts God, have given, God has given to him and serving us in that way. So thank you, Adam, for leading us well last week through a, a difficult text, but a good text. And so this morning uh, we have another text uh, that might appear difficult on its face, but I pray it's a great comfort to us who are in Christ this morning. This is Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 49 through through the end of the chapter, verse 59. Hear the word of the Lord. I came to cast fire on the earth, and would that it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. For from now on in one house there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, When you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once, A shower is coming. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, There will be a scorching heat. And it happens. You hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and sky. But why do you not know how to interpret the present time? He also said to the crowds, Excuse me. And why do you not judge for yourselves what is right? As you go with your accuser before the magistrate, make an effort to settle with him on the way, lest he drag you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and the officer puts you in prison. I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the very last penny. It's the word of the Lord. Let's pray together and ask for God's wisdom this morning. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is true, inspired, inerrant, and sufficient. Lord, I thank you that we can trust in you, we can trust in your word, that you reveal yourself truly in it. And so, Lord, today I pray that we would see Jesus Christ. Lord, help us by your Holy Spirit. Give us understanding. Give us faith. And help us to walk in obedience. Lord, I pray your words be heard and not my own, that you receive all the glory. In the name of Christ, I pray these things. Amen. Blood is thicker than water. You've often heard that phrase, I'm sure. When we say this, we're saying something to the effect of the fact that family should be more important to you than those who are not family. When it comes down to it, you're to put your family first before other people. That blood is thicker than water. But when push comes to shove, we see in our world today that many families choose to divide. Whether for good reasons or for bad reasons. Sometimes the blood might be thicker than the water, but occasionally there's bad blood between two members of a family. It causes estrangement, causes difficulty, and eventually division. Though we speak of blood being thicker than water, and it's true, there's only one family that you're born into genetically, there's often an opportunity for something to happen to cause a family to divide. Sometimes it's a divorce. Sometimes it's a crime. Sometimes it's a dispute about money or property. And we should rightly concede that none of these are a good reason to divide. They're all tragedies, and yet they are so often seen in our fallen world. 
as a reason families are divided from one another. But let me ask the question this morning. What about when a family is divided by Jesus? What are we to think about a division like that one? Is the blood thicker than the water? What if Jesus came to invite us into a relationship that's even thicker than a blood relationship? For example, what are we to think of the young lady who's raised in a home where the parents are not believers? It's a non-Christian home. And she goes off to college and Christ finds her in her first year as a freshman. And she decides she wants to leave behind the life that her parents had for her and to pursue Christ and go be a missionary, causing her to be estranged from mom and dad. What do we think of that division? Is that a blessing or a tragedy? Maybe consider another instance, a father who has a wife and has children, but who is not a Christian, who comes to know Christ and then determines at that point that he wants to lead his home in a godly way and seeks to reorient his family's life around the church, but that causes his son to maybe despise him. Is this a tragedy? I know ideally it's a, it's a good thing and a biblical thing for the family to follow Jesus and that together, right? Right? Not that a mother follows Jesus over here and a father follows Jesus over here, but that we follow Jesus together as family. But Jesus tells us that's not always going to be the case. Here we learn from this text, Jesus himself promises to divide even families for the sake of the gospel. Just pointing to this truth that a person's relationship to Christ is the most important relationship that they have in their existence. Jesus' dividing of the family is not division for the sake of division, but division for the sake of the gospel. We see this main idea in the text, that the work of Christ reorients every human relationship. The Bible speaks of sheep and goats. It speaks of the church and the world, the righteous and the unrighteous, those who belong to the world and those who do not. And these distinctions are not dependent upon money or class or accomplishments or achievements, but God's grace and His grace alone. I want us to see two truths in this text. First, that Jesus divides. Jesus tells us that much clearly, that He's not come to bring peace necessarily, certainly not peace at all costs, but he's come to bring division. Look at verse 49. He says, I came to cast fire on the earth and would that it were already kindled. Fire, in this context and in many others in the scripture, fire is a picture of judgment. It's it's a reminder to us that judgment is imminent. We are all marching each day towards the day of judgment. There's nothing we can do to avoid that reality. Now, this judgment that Jesus points to doesn't happen primarily in his first advent, but in his second coming. So Jesus here is announcing that judgment will come. But in his second coming, he's going to execute that judgment upon the earth. That's why Jesus says he came to cast fire on the earth, but he wishes it was already kindled. He wishes it was already judgment day. We see references to the fires of judgment all throughout the New Testament. Just consider a few examples with me this morning. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 13 says each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. Paul notes here the fires of judgment are coming to test everyone's work. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul is encouraging Christians to do good works in the name of Jesus Christ, not to waste their time and energy on those things that will not last for eternity. Another example in 2 Thessalonians from Paul. Paul uses the theme of judgment to comfort the Christians there in Thessalonica. 2 Thessalonians 1, in verse 5, he says, This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God. 
that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering. Since, indeed, God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Here we see the fires of judgment. And and Paul encourages the church at Thessalonica that there's judgment coming for those who oppress the things of God, for those who oppress the church, those who persecute the church. All those who do not obey the Lord Jesus Christ will receive a trial by fire. And so Jesus tells us that he has come to seek and to save the lost. But he has also come to divide those who are lost from those who are saved. And the way this division is clearly displayed is by a judgment of fire. Notice Jesus in verse 49 says, The fire is coming, but it's not yet been kindled. Jesus wishes it had begun, but it's a long way off. Now this might seem unusual to us. Because doesn't the Lord of heaven and earth, the Son of God who came to seek and save that which was lost, doesn't he desire for those who are lost to be found? Doesn't he desire for sinners to be saved? Why does he desire for the judgment to come? Because the judgment that he will execute comes after the agonies of the cross. You see, Jesus wishes the judgment had come because he wishes the cross was in his past, but yet it is still in his future. Jesus is not looking forward to enduring the cross. He despises the shame of the cross. However, he is looking forward to that joy which awaits him on the other side of the cross. That's what Philippians 2 tells us. And part of that joy is the consummation of all things, the final Judgment, And I think we can understand this more clearly by understanding what's said in verse number 50. Jesus says, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Jesus here speaks about judgment as baptism. And this is not a baptism of joy like we are going to get to experience this morning here in just a few moments. But Jesus has a baptism of distress that he is distressed about his coming baptism. Well, what does Jesus mean here? Well, he's talking about the cross. This baptism that will come is the baptism that will occur on Calvary's hill. That Jesus will take his cross, he will march up that great hill, and he will suffer and die in the place of his precious people and bear the wrath of God in their place. Notice three things in this text. First, Jesus says that he has a baptism to be baptized with. Jesus is an active sufferer in this moment, but a passive recipient of the wrath of God. He is receiving punishment that he did not earn. Jesus did not create the torment that he experienced on the cross because of his own crimes, but because of our crimes. Jesus' baptism in this text is about his obedience. That he has come to be baptized in the wrath of God's just judgment. That when Jesus hung upon Calvary's cross, at that point he suffered in our place, becoming obedient unto death. This is what we just sang about. This is the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us. God judged Jesus on the cross as a substitute for sinners. This is what Jesus means by his baptism. Notice, secondly, that Jesus says his soul is in anguish about this upcoming baptism. Even though Jesus Christ was truly God and truly man, the cross was no easy feat to accomplish. When he prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, the scripture tells us he's sorrowful unto death. The burden Christ carried up Calvary's hill was no light and easy burden, but it was very great as the sins of mankind were laid upon his shoulders. But notice third in this text how we see Jesus' great anguish until it is accomplished. 
The word Jesus used here, that word accomplish, is the same word that's used when Jesus cries out on the cross, it is finished. Jesus' baptism is a baptism by fire. It's a baptism in the wrath of God, but he will accomplish it. He has done everything that is necessary to redeem his people. This is what Jesus has come to do. Jesus does not die upon Calvary's hill by accident or by mistake. No, the king of kings has set his face to Jerusalem to do what he has come to do. Why? So he can divide the sheep from the goats, the believers from the unbelievers, the people of God from those who follow after the prince of this world. And because Jesus has been baptized for judgment, we can be baptized for salvation. Richard Gaffin, New Testament scholar, says this, for the Messianic people to be baptized for salvation, he, the Messiah, must be baptized with condemnation and curse. It was necessary that Christ himself pass through judgment, and moreover, that in the process endure the just wrath of God for the sins of his people. This is one reason why baptism is such an important thing in the Christian life, because it is a baptism into Jesus' death. Romans 6, verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We must understand the New Testament does not simply present baptism as something that we do, but it is something that is judicial in its nature. There's a declaration being made in baptism. So that is in baptism. The one being baptized is certainly saying something, but also God himself is saying something about the one being baptized. We see a great example of this when Jesus is baptized by John in the Jordan River. Once Jesus is baptized, the Lord himself speaks from heaven and says, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Throughout Jesus' earthly ministry, we see that this Son of God accomplished everything that was necessary to redeem God's people from sin and death and shame. So now... Whenever someone wades into the waters of baptism, God himself can declare over them, you are my beloved. With you, I am well pleased. But the basis of this declaration has nothing to do with our works. It has to do with the works of Jesus Christ. At its core, baptism is not proclaiming that we've been saved by our own works but that we are trusting in Jesus Christ and in his works to be saved. So when someone wades into the waters of baptism, I think it's right we understand them making the proclamation that I belong to Jesus Christ, but at the same time, the Lord himself is making a proclamation saying, this person belongs to me. How can such a thing be said about a sinner? How can we find approval before the throne of God? Because of Jesus Christ. Because he has taken our sins upon himself. Because he has been baptized in the judgment. The only reason we can be baptized with water is because Christ first has been baptized in the fire. God judged Jesus in your place so that when you repent and believe the gospel, God has no wrath to pour out upon you. Rather, you receive Christ's righteousness by virtue of faith in Christ's work on your behalf. This is the good news of the gospel. That Jesus has endured the wrath of God to save his people so that we might become his beloved children. So what effect does this baptism have for believers? Look at verse 51. Do you think I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. For from now on in one house, there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Boy, that doesn't sound like a happy scenario, does it? Sounds like a mess. Why all the division in 
Presumably, this, this one family, we might consider this is the exact opposite of what we should expect to happen. All this good news about the gospel. If the work of Jesus is so good, why does it cause so much division? It's because those who are not in Christ are separated from God. Their minds are darkened. Their hearts are stone. They do not understand the things of God. And Jesus here wants us to understand this simple reality that the faith of a family member does not merit union with Christ. The waters of baptism are more significant than the water of the womb. I've heard it said that God only has children. He does not have grandchildren. This is the division that Jesus is speaking of. When you believe the gospel... When you become a Christian, you have a more significant relationship with Jesus Christ than any of your biological relationships. It's more important that you are named by Christ than by your parents. The name of Christ is more important than your last name. This is a hard teaching, friends. And I say these things because Jesus says them. And I know for many of you in this room, That you have family who are lost. You have family who do not know the Lord Jesus. And if that's you, would you you tell me so I can pray for you, so I can pray for your lost family members? And can I remind you that the same God who poured out His grace upon you is able to pour out His grace upon your children. There is no prodigal who is beyond the grace of God today. And yet, we cannot miss out on this reality That if we are to be devoted to the Lord, we will be at enmity with the Lord. A number of years ago, I got to spend some time talking with a missionary to the Middle East. He had worked in a heavily persecuted Muslim region. There were many house churches because they couldn't meet publicly like we are this morning. And he was telling me about the underground church where he served and how it was so persecuted. And he told me that there was a, a man, a Muslim man, that he had been praying, that he had been praying for for a while. He had come to know Christ, this Muslim man had. And when a Muslim person converts to Christianity, in this context, this missionary was speaking of, oftentimes they might profess faith with their mouth, but they won't undergo baptism. Because the moment they are baptized, they are then estranged from the rest of their family. So he told me the story about this Muslim man. He had come to faith in Christ, and after years of wrestling, had finally decided he was ready to be baptized. And so he told the missionary what he was going to do, and he said, first, I must go and tell my family that I've decided to follow Jesus of Nazareth. So this Muslim man went in, sat down with a family member, I believe it was a cousin, I can't remember exactly, sat down with this individual and told him, I've, I've decided to follow Jesus of Nazareth. He, he is my Savior. And this family member looked at this now brother in Christ. Family member looked at this individual. He was sitting on a bar stool. He stood up and he picked up that bar stool and proceeded to beat his family member right then and there because he professed to believe in Jesus Christ. This Muslim man dragged this Christian brother, this family member, out into the street and told the rest of the people in the community that this, this, this person has left the religion of Islam and is going to follow Jesus. And an angry mob came out and began to persecute this brother in Christ. And he was left for dead because he wanted to be baptized in the name of our triune God. This is the division that Jesus is speaking of here. If you trust in Christ's work, if you believe what he has done for you on the cross, if you proclaim Christ as your Savior, division is in store for you. It's what Jesus has come to do, to divide the sheep from the goats and the church from the world. And this might sound ominous to us. It might sound threatening to us. It might scare us to consider so many people being opposed to us because of what Jesus has done for us. I'm reminded of what John Knox once said. English reformer, he says, the man who stands with God is always in the majority. Friend, that should be a comfort to us. Thankfully, this man in the Middle East who was attacked by the mob did not die. 
God in his grace allowed the man to be hidden by some Christian brothers and sisters and actually a medical professional from a nearby place was flown in to give this man the medical care he needed. Why did this man go through so much torment, so much torture? Because he wanted to identify with Jesus. Because he wanted to be baptized. And this identification with Christ caused him to be divided from his own family. Friends, if you're going to follow Jesus Christ, there's going to be division in your life. There might even be division in your own family. Jesus has come to bring division. And yet, this division is not within inside the walls of the church, but it's a division between the church and the world. Let me just remind you today, friends, it is a good thing to be on the side of Jesus Christ, even if the world condemns us. Because Jesus Christ has overcome the world. The good news of the gospel assures us of our hope, even if division is a reality in our lives. But we see not only in this text that Jesus divides, but a second truth, that Jesus reconciles. Jesus changes gear here in verse 54, changing his, his talk to a discourse about the weather. Oh, isn't the, hasn't the weather been so nice this weekend? That wasn't the case Wednesday morning at 6 o'clock when my alarm went off and I heard the rain coming down the gutters. And I just thought, oh, I just want to stay in the bed today. I do not want to get out of the house. And yet, it's best not to complain about the weather because God controls the weather, right? Nevertheless, I knew that it was raining outside. I could hear it. And so I got up and rather than dressing like I did yesterday, I put on my boots and I put on my jacket and I prepared to go out into the elements, even though it was just a short walk for me. And so Jesus here instructs the hearers. He says, you, you know how to read the signs of the sky. You know how to prepare when it's about to rain. But do you know how to interpret the signs of the times? You see it in verse 54 there. He says, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once a shower is coming. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say there will be scorching heat. And it happens. Jesus here chastises the crowd because they can understand the weather, but they don't know the signs of the time. You see in verse 56, he says, you hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? Jesus says to the crowd, you should know what time it is, and you should prepare accordingly for that time. You know, a few weeks ago, Sumner County uh, shut down the schools on a Friday because there was a forecast of some severe winds and some, some storms coming through. And the winds came and, and blew down a, a bunch of trees and made a mess and knocked out the power for most of Trousdale County, I think. But thankfully, there were no school buses on the road. Thankfully, there was a decision that was, that was made that allowed people to prepare accordingly. If you know a storm is coming, you probably won't stay outside. But if you know the judgment of God is coming, what kind of preparation will you make? What if you knew tomorrow was not promised? This is why Jesus calls the crowds hypocrites. They are more concerned about rightly preparing for the weather than they are for eternity. You see it in verse 57, this illustration Jesus gives. And why do you not judge for yourselves what is right? As you go with your accuser before the magistrate, make an effort to settle with him on the way, lest he drag you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and the officer put you in prison. I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. This illustration Jesus gives would have been plain to everyone in that day and age. The idea here is there's a man with a considerable debt that he cannot pay. And the one who he owes the money to is going to take the case before the judge. And the judge is going to demand that the one who owes the debt pay and settle the case. And Jesus says that the man who owes the debt should do everything that he can to try to settle that debt before the judgment is pronounced by the judge. And if the man is thrown in jail, he must, do, he must pay every single penny before he can be released. Jesus is, is essentially saying to the crowd, don't you think it's a good idea to pay off the balance on your loan before the balance is due? Don't you think that's a good idea? 
rather than just to live in your debts? Don't you think it's a good idea to try to consolidate your debt, to get rid of it while you still can, while there's still time? If the man is thrown in jail, his relatives will be the one who will have to pay this money back. What are we to make of this illustration? Well, Jesus' call in this text is a call to repent while there's still time. If you knew that tomorrow you had to come up with $10,000 or you were going to be thrown in jail and you didn't have $10,000, I bet you'd probably cancel your Sunday afternoon nap, wouldn't you? You'd probably do something to try to find $10,000, to sell something, to call a relative, to beg for mercy, to do whatever you can to make sure you have enough money to pay this debt so that you don't go to jail because... In this illustration, once the man is jailed, he can do nothing to set himself free. Friends, today Jesus is calling us to understand the debt that we owe. What do we owe to God? Well, we owe God perfect, perpetual obedience in all things. We owe him the glory of all of our lives. We owe him honor as the creator as the master of the universe. And what have we given to the Lord? Nothing but unrighteousness and disobedience. Our debt is so great, we cannot pay it on our own. Jesus is begging the crowd to understand how serious their condition is and how short time is and to make it right while there's still time. If we have enough sense to carry an umbrella when it's raining... Do we have enough sense to repent while there's still time? Friends, this is Jesus' call to be reconciled to him. This is the good news of the gospel, that though we are debtors and though our debt is very great, we have racked up a debt of sin that we cannot pay, that Jesus can pay it. The God-man has ransomed us from the wages of our sin. He has taken our debt upon himself, marched up, Calvary's hill and nailed it to the cross. The good news of the gospel is that God judged Jesus upon Calvary's cross. That Jesus did not take his own debt to Calvary, but mine and yours. He perfectly obeyed the Father so that we might go free. So I ask today, has the Son of God paid the debt that you owe? Do you believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know that you are a sinner and that you need a Savior? Do you believe in his bodily resurrection from the dead? That Jesus not only died for you, but that he rose for you, that you might have life and life abundantly. Friends, though the gospel divides us from the world, it reconciles us to God. There is no one else who could pay the debt that we owe. Let me just ask, do you know how short time is? And do you know how long eternity is? Do you know that every moment Christ's return is nearer? On that day, payment will be required. And if Christ has not paid your debt, if your faith is not in him, well, you'll have to pay for that debt yourself. And the scripture teaches very plainly the way that we pay for this debt ourselves is by spending an eternity under God's righteous wrath in a place the Bible calls hell. Friends, that's a fate I wish upon none of you today. Rather, consider the free gift of God in Jesus Christ, the gift of salvation, the gift of a debt freely paid by the grace and mercy of God. Friends, if you believe in Jesus Christ, if your faith is in Him, if you know Christ and believe that He was punished for your sin upon Calvary's cross, you will be saved. It's the promise of God. And if God has judged Jesus in your place, you can be certain that the Lord of all glory will not judge you on the last day. That Christ is will be your rock of refuge. And if that's the case, friends, if judgment day holds no ill for us, then we should look forward to that day. 
when Jesus Christ will come to judge the living and the dead? Are you ready for his return? Are you reconciled to God? Christians do not need to fear judgment day because we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have been reconciled to God, you can expect to be divided from the world. But if you are not reconciled to the Lord, you can expect on the last day to be divided from the people of God. Jesus asked the crowd to rightly discern the times, and I would ask you to do the same, because none of us are promised the next day. Friends, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, take heart that even if the world hates you, that Christ will hold you close to himself. But if you do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ today, if your soul finds no comfort or no forgiveness of sins, I pray you hear Christ's words today and settle the great debt that you owe. Come to Christ, who is rich in mercy, rich beyond all measure, and find life and joy and peace and hope forevermore.